Hello and welcome back to Wine with Andy. I am Andy. And we're on to the last of our nature versus nurture wine tastings today. We're going to be tasting a couple of red wines. I let you know last time the wines that you'd need to try and find to taste along with me. We're going to be tasting one Pinot Noir from Burgundy in France and one Gamay from Beaujolais, which is also actually part of the Burgundy wine region, but it's kind of a, a sub-region all of its own. So one Gamay from Beaujolais. I've got mine here ready to go. Hopefully you've got yours somewhere nearby as well. But if you don't, don't worry, you can pause the video here and run off to the shops and I'm sure I'll still be here when you get back with your wines. But for those of you who do have the wines ready to go, let's get straight into the tasting. I've got my two wine glasses here that are identical because of course we want the only thing that's going to be different between them to be the wine inside. Now, I'm going to pour the Burgundy, the Pinot Noir, into my left hand glass here. There we go. And let's just put the cork back in that one. I'm going to pour my Gamay, my Beaujolais, into my right hand glass. That's that one ready to go. So, tasting. First step is, of course, to look at them. Let's pick up these wines and I'm going to tilt them against a light background, convenient enough. I've got a light coloured table here. And there's really not too much difference to, uh, to see between them. Maybe uh, the, the Gamay is very, very slightly more intense in colour, but they're both very light. They're both see-through. Uh, I, can, I can see the table through them, definitely. Uh, and uh, yeah, they are, they are very, very similar. They're, from the colour, I would expect that these are going to be both quite light wines. Light in colour, light wine, is what you expect. Uh, so let's dive into the tasting and see if that bears out. I'm going to start off with just giving my Pinot Noir a sniff. Okay, so we're thinking about fruit. What have we got? We've got, we've got berry fruit. It's kind of red, maybe a touch black. We've got a little bit of both going on. Uh, it's certainly quite tangy, but also reasonably juicy and sweet. Uh, it's sort of ripe, but not overripe, not, under, not underripe. But yeah, nice juicy tangy fruit uh, on that one. On the uh, Beaujolais, the Gamay. First impression, I've got quite similar fruit, actually. Juicy, tangy, a little bit sweet. Not much more that I can tell there. Let's give them a swirl and see what else comes out of the glass to greet us. On the Pinot Noir. Well, I've still got that fruit. I've got a little bit more intensity of that fruit. It's still kind of tangy, slightly sappy maybe I'd call it. There's a slight sort of green edge to it, but really, really very slight. But alongside that now, I have something very savoury. I have something kind of herbal, kind of earthy. Um, maybe, maybe I might even say mushroom. Uh, it's kind of a funny, funny word for a wine, but uh, nobody's judging so mushroom it is on the Beaujolais let's have a think well I've got that fruits continuing but this with, with there's there's not that savory note there's not none of the earthiness it's still nice clean fruit in fact maybe it's a little bit too clean almost it's kind of sort of synthetic almost, it's confected. And maybe there's even the edge of something a little bit caramelized to it. It seems a bit separate. The fruit itself seems quite juicy and fresh and ripe. It's not jammy fruit, but it definitely seems as if maybe you're, you're sniffing a, a berry flavored candy rather than a berry. It's that kind of, sugary, slightly confected smell to it. Let's see what happens on the palate. Uh, 
And of course, we're remembering to make those silly faces, to suck the air through, to make those silly noises, and uh, to really swirl the white in between our teeth and our lips so that we can feel the effect of the tannins on our lips. Now on the palette for the Pinot Noir, I have that acid is very prominent. I've got high acidity. I've got uh, no sugar, obviously, because this is a dry wine. I've got tannins. Well, they're definitely there. I can feel them. They're not particularly high, low to medium tannins. They're kind of, in terms of the texture of the tannins, I've got, it's not smooth. It's not really coarse. It's somewhere in the middle. It's kind of lumpy. Uh, slightly weird word, but um, that definitely conveys in my mind what, what I'm, I'm, I'm feeling from this wine. Uh, the flavours are much the same. I've got the same core of kind of sappy, tangy, juicy fruit. I've got that, that sort of herbal, slightly earthy um, note on the side as well. On the Beaujolais, let's have a, have a sip. Similar acid, probably much the same, maybe a smidge lower, maybe. Um, on the tannins, that's the real difference in terms of the sort of uh, functional characteristics of the wine. The, the tannins on this are very, very much lower. And the texture is very different as well. They're smooth, they're really, really smooth. Uh, they're like like velvet or like a piece of paper sort of stuck to the inside of your lip. Very smooth. Uh, but And they don't hang around either. Whereas the kind of lumpy tannins from the Pinot Noir were there and they kind of stuck there for a little bit. These are, these are really there and then gone. They're, 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 they're kind of that low that they're, they're a fleeting impression of nice smooth tannins. The flavours, well... I've got more of that juicy fruit. I've got some of that, that sweetness, that confected note still. And I, I still really don't have any, any additional kind of herby or earthy notes that I, I am getting from the Pinot Noir. It's still quite clean fruit. Now, while you continue to sip away and, and think about maybe some of the similarities, the, the juicy, sappy fruit in both of these, and the differences, so the earthiness versus the kind of confected notes that you're hopefully getting, I'm going to have a go at thinking about where those differences come from. Well, the Pinot Noir is made from Pinot Noir, funnily enough. It's, uh, and, and actually that kind of sappy fruit and that earthy note are quite characteristic of Pinot Noir generally. So that's kind of explains pretty quickly where, where those notes coming from. On the Beaujolais, well, again, that kind of sappy fruit is a characteristic of Gamay as a grape. But the, the notes that I've, I've got that are kind of slightly confected, well, those are actually coming from a choice that the winemaker has made. They're coming from a process called carbonic maceration. Now carbonic maceration is a special kind of fermentation and in this way it happens when after the grapes are picked they're kept as whole bunches and just sort of dumped into vats and the very bottom layer of grapes gets crushed under the weight of the ones above them and so as the juices are released the yeast that are sort of living on the skins of the grapes starts to ferment the sugar in that juice and you get your regular fermentation with sugar being turned into alcohol. And a byproduct of that is carbon dioxide. So as this sort of initial fermentation happens, that carbon dioxide slowly fills up the vat and pushes the air and the oxygen in the air out. So you get this this carbon dioxide blanket sort of rising up through your vat of grapes, flushing out the oxygen, which means that your, your remaining uncrushed grapes at the sort of middle and top of, of the, the vat are left in this oxygen-free environment. And in that environment, 
they start to break down internally with just the sort of the enzymes in the grapes starting to break down uh, the, the com various compounds inside the grapes uh, as they would sort of rotting naturally. Uh, it sounds a bit unattractive when I say it, rotting. Um, you'd think that wouldn't produce something that you'd want to drink, but it does in fact. Uh, it produces some rather nice wine as we've got in front of us today. But to get back to the, the, the sort of practicalities of, of what that, that means, well, the, the breakdown is, the special fermentation the, is, is breaking down compounds like acids, it's breaking down compounds in the, in the skins of the grapes that give colour and tannin to wine. And it's breaking down some of the sugars and turning it into alcohol. And it sort of, as it does all of that, as this, this special fermentation does all of that, it's also producing particular types of flavour compounds. And some of those are the flavour compounds that are giving you that kind of slightly synthetic confected note. So one of the effects of carbonic maceration is wine with this, this really characteristic, slightly synthetic, confected smell to it. Now the wine I've got in front of me here has only had a little bit of, of sort of influence from that, so it doesn't really taste over the top of this synthetic fruit, it's just there, it's noticeable, but it's not really whopping you in the face. But if you have a wine that's really, really sort of uh, heavily affected by carbonic maceration, it can really taste of sort of banana and bubblegum and synthetic blueberry. It's really, really very noticeable. Uh, depending on what you've managed to find, you might have something that really strikes you with those particular notes. And the winemaker can actually control the extent to which this carbonic maceration happens pretty finely. I mentioned that in this case it's from a sort of fairly natural sounding process where you get this, this sort of initial yeast based regular fermentation that slowly flushes out the air and allows carbonic maceration to happen in the rest of the grapes. But you can create this thing synthetically as well, you can flush, you can artificially flush uh, carbon dioxide through, you can keep the grapes whole, you can use dry, out, dry ice or, or whatever else to produce carbon dioxide and, and put grapes in this oxygen free environment to induce carbonic maceration uh, artificially. And you can control the amount of time that lasts, you can equally you can control the amount of time you leave your, your grapes in the sort of semi-natural process as well. Uh, to decide how much of the sort of effect of this carbonic maceration you want in the final wine. If you leave it completely to its own devices then eventually the wines, uh, the, the grapes rather, reach sort of such a state of internal decomposition that they burst and you get the juice flowing out and you get regular yeast-based fermentation taking over anyway. But if you choose you can stop it before that point and you can crush the grapes get the juice and continue to ferment uh, as per your usual red wine. So you can, you can control really finely the, uh, the extent to which you get these carbonic maceration flavours in the final wine. Another effect of carbonic maceration, I mentioned it, it sort of starts to break down the, uh, the uh, compounds in the skins of the grape that give you colour and tannin. So another couple of effects when you get slightly lighter colours. If you ever find a Gamay that's not undergone carbonic maceration, you'll find that it's slightly darker in colour actually. And you'll also find that it's more tannic. So uh, I, I, I could really feel on when I put this wine in my mouth that the tannins were very soft, very smooth, and that's as a result of it undergoing carbonic maceration. It's, it's it's that carbonic maceration process that's caused the tannins to be that soft. So that pretty much explains what's going on with the flavour differences and how that's related to the winemaking process. But we need to complete our uh, wine tasting process, of course, with thinking about these wines. So let's have another quick taste. You've probably been tasting along whilst I've been waffling, but uh, I haven't, so I'm going to have, a, have another quick taste of both of these. It 
So in terms of preferences, well, I guess they're very similar ways actually, but uh, it depends really on the situation for me. I would happily drink either of these. I do. I, I know that I like wines that have carbonic maceration type flavours, so uh, in some situations I w would um, would love to drink those as well. This one, as I said, is is sort of quite subtle in the carbonic maceration influence. But on the Pinot Noir, let's have a think about that a moment. What would I have this with? Well, I've got high acid. I've got nice sort of tangy berry flavours, I've got medium-ish tannins, so I probably want a medium weight kind of protein dish uh, with a reasonable amount of, of flavour uh, and with maybe a reasonable amount of sort of richness of fattiness to, to sort of uh, match with that acid. So maybe a really good match with this would be duck because it has that sort of richness of flavour, it has that slight gaminess, it has the, the, the fattiness, duck is quite a fatty meat. And of course you would often have duck with an accompaniment that's kind of quite fruity. If you think duck à l'orange or duck with a kind of berry sauce, then those berry flavours are going to match really well with that. On the Beaujolais, well, it actually has a lot of the same characteristics, so you could match it with many of the same things. The fact that the tannins are smoother and lighter means that maybe it would also match nicely with lighter meats. So you could potentially feed this to somebody who insists on drinking red wine with uh, chicken or fish. Not that that's a bad thing, of course, you can, uh, you can, you can drink red wine with, with chicken and fish. Uh, it would actually match rather nicely with, with a, a heavier fish, so a really, really meaty white fish, or maybe something like tuna or swordfish. Um, so that would, that would work very well. It would work with chicken. Um, but also this, this, uh, this low tannin, this smooth tannin opens up new possibilities. So in the summer, this is really nice for drinking on its own. The low tannin means that your mouth isn't going to get sort of clogged up with that astringent tannin effect. And especially if you if you chill this slightly, if you give it 20 minutes in the fridge, it'd be lovely on a, on a nice warm summer's evening. But it also means that you can drink it with stuff that's maybe a little bit less protein heavy. So vegetable based dishes, things that are say, uh, maybe a, a chickpea based tagine, something like that would be really good with this. Um, I'm thinking of the sort of spices and, and maybe the, the influence of maybe a, the occasional sweet um, bit of, of, of dried fruit that you find in a tagine as well would match very nicely with the flavours in here. Um, there's something about that slight synthetic note that really reminds me of cinnamon. Um, that, again, tagine. Anyway, I'll stop banging on about tagines. Um, but this would also match quite nicely with cheeses. So that, that lower tannin means that there's going to be less of a sort of dissonance effect where you have lots of tannins but not so much protein to go with it. So if you think about something like a cheddar or a really nice mature red leicester, well you might have that with the kind of relish or um, a, a quince paste that has a lot of um, nice sort of tangy fruit. Well this has got that tangy fruit, it's also got um, the acidity to cut through the creaminess, the richness of cheese, so it would be a, a good match for that as well. Well this brings us to the end of this tasting and to the end of this little Nature vs Nurture series. I hope you've enjoyed tasting along with me and spotting some of those things that come from choices that are made in the vineyard and in the winemaking process. And I'll be back in the not too distant future with uh, some more tastings, so keep an eye out on the channel or maybe click that subscribe link down below if you'd like to be notified for when that, that those new tastings uh, pop up. But for the meantime, I'm going to enjoy my nice low tannin Beaujolais. I'm going to enjoy sipping away at that. Uh, and I hope you, you can finish up your wines. Uh, you can find a nice food match for those. And uh, until next time, cheers. Mm -hmm.